Welcome everyone to the Wilmot Institute's third and final web talk in our series by Todd Lawson about the glioma last month. Today, Todd is going to talk about the Bob's great announcement to Mullah Hussein, Chapter 1 of the Ayom al-Asma, the Surah of Dominion of Mulk. Today, of course, we're turning again to Todd Lawson, who uh, has really dazzled us with two talks already about the Ayom al-Asma. He's a professor emeritus in Islamic thought at the University of Toronto, got his degree uh, from McGill or Toronto? T Toronto, I guess. McGill. Been from McGill, thank you. I've uh, been a Baha'i since 1968, been involved in the Association for Baha'i Studies since it began. Uh, his recent uh, book on the Qayyum al-Asma, Gnostic Apocalypse uh, and Islam, Rutledge uh, 2012, um, was uh, given an award. He's also published numerous other books related to the Baha'i faith in Islam, Quran commentary, Sufism and Shiism, and his most recent book, Intimacy and Ecstasy in Quran Commentary, is a study of the Bob's earliest major work. And there's a lot more, of course, available uh, at a particular Brill publishing website about that book. Todd lives in Montreal with his wife, Barbara. And uh, Todd, thank you so much for joining us today. We're delighted to have you once more. And we're very grateful for your contribution to this series and to our series on the bicentenary of the birth of the boss. So I will turn it over to you and we will start sharing your screen instead. All right, so hello everyone. Uh, it's good to not see you. I, uh, I've been enjoying this uh, series very much and especially enjoying the comments that I read and uh, once in a while respond to and I'm getting better at uh, using the uh, interfaces, Moodle, Zoom, and whatever else there might be. Uh, this is our last uh, session, and I wanted to start by showing this star, everyone, although we had it before. This is a, a creation of the Bobs. We don't exactly know how old he was when he did this, or when he did it, it's uh, ravishingly beautiful uh, star. Looks like it's simultaneously cold and hot, burning and uh, cool, on fire and uh, and frozen. It's in. It's important to bear in mind these possibilities of joining opposites when reading the, especially the Kayumu Asma, because. The, the Bob does this quite frequently, and it's one of the things that caused earlier readers to scratch their head and say, this is nonsense. You see in many places the Bob referring to something like the, the low height or the freezing heat or uh, 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 the outer inner and things like this. Uh, these are very important things. Uh, figures that that we may not get a whole lot of time to talk about today, but I'm just I just want to say that the, the there's a great unity in the Bob's work, and even though this is a more purely graphic work of art by the Bob, it is nonetheless uh, very much in tune with with the more uh, traditionally uh, written texts. Uh, so this is a this is a star. It's a, in the form of a prayer and a series of invocations. The original is in the British Museum. You can order a copy of it if you like. It's much bigger than this, and I don't have a, co a copy here. But I'm thinking I would like to order a copy so I could read more easily the the script that is that is there. It's a little a little murky, although some of the stuff comes through. But uh, it would be nice to try and. <laughs> translate this if that's the proper word. Uh, in any case, the star, as you know, is very important as a, a five-pointed star. The Guardian said this is the true symbol of the Baha'i faith. And possibly one of the reasons this is so is because the five, five is the number of perfection. And uh, perfection in so far as it represents a human being, the head, the arms, and the legs. And uh, this is a uh, 
this is a motif that runs all through the Baha'i writings and the Bob's writings, the importance of humanity, the importance of the individual human being uh, the, as, a, as, a, as the eye through which God sees creation and through the, the eye through which creation sees God sort of thing. Uh, so uh, the, the station of humanity is raised commensurately with the intensity and the uh, vastness of the revelation. And just as a side intro, uh, side side note, uh, when we had the last two sessions, uh, the first one I was in England, and uh, the second one I just gotten off the plane, so that's why I was half asleep and I was trying to do it. I hope you forgive me. But I was over there because I was attending some Baha'i studies conferences. The first one was in, at Oxford, and the second one was at in Acuto in Italy. And after Oxford, Barbara and I went to Italy and drove down from Pisa. It's about 300 miles or something to Acuto. And on the way down, we stopped in a town, uh, the city of Orvieto, a very beautiful Italian city. I'm sure, everybody's familiar with. And went to the magnificent uh, cathedral there, Duomo, and looking around. And I had just given the talk in Oxford on the Baha on the Bob as an artist, and I'd used this this image to uh, try and help make the point. And we were walking around the inside of the cathedral uh, and the various sections of the cathedral, and super beautiful and ornate Italian. Uh, beauty and uh, there was a statue of the or a sculptural representation of the biblical theme of behold the man ecce or ecce homo when when uh, pilate brings jesus out to the to the crowd of of uh, you know clamoring for his death and all the rest of it and says behold the man here here is the person you're you're talking about, and Jesus was in a very sort of weakened state and so forth. And the part of the idea seems to have been, this is what this is the person you're so afraid of, and so on. Right under that statue, uh, the artisans who built the cathedral, and you know, say 800 years ago, I'm not sure, had in the decoration, which is all sort of sliced slabs of marble. Had done had had affixed the following uh, marble slice, uh, in, in which is, I'm going to show you now. If, I, if things work, of course it doesn't work. Uh, there it is. Now you can you see that <laughs> as a as a kind of ecce homo uh, reflection in the actual marble that was used to make the uh, make the cathedral and it reminded me so much of the star of the bob that i tried to take a decent picture of it to to use when talking about it in the future so today we're going to look at the first chapter of this of the Asma called the chapter of dominion that's one way to translate this word mulk m u l k it comes from the Arabic root MLK, which also, as you know, stands for Martin Luther King. Uh, and I'm sure that the Bob and his followers would make much of this, because there are no accidents in language or uh, alphabet when, uh, when speaking about the truth. In any case, we're going to look at this first surah. But before we do that, I want to show you just a little bit of what the extent of the completed surah that the Bab revealed for Mullah Hussein on that important evening when you could say that the Baha'i era began two hours and 11 minutes after sunset on the evening before the 23rd of May. <clears throat> as, so um, this is, as far as we know, the very oldest manuscript of the Qayyum al-Asma, and this is the first chapter. This is not in the Bob's handwriting. 
uh, at all. It was, uh, it was done sometime after that first evening, but was sent abroad and presented to one of the uh, 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 ulama of Iran. And you see here, can you see my pointer if I move it around? Can you see my pointer? Yes, we yes. can. Yes, we can. Okay. So up here, you see these two lines. These these represent the the sword that the 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 mullah used to strike the text when it was presented to him. Uh, this is, as I said, this is the oldest uh, oldest manuscript that we have. This is, and the the entire chapter of Mulk is here, these two pages. So it's about 800 words in Arabic, 800 words in length. And you, you can see uh, here, you see the, the little circle there? That's a, that's a, a verse ending. That's a standard marker for verse ending in the Quran and other texts. It's a little, uh, uh, it's actually kind of a, an Arabic H that they use to mark the end of a, line, uh, of a verse. So this is what it looked like. That's the oldest manuscript. Here's another manuscript that is uh, published by the uh, people of the Bayan. There's a, that's what the uh, the followers of the Bab who are still alive, who did not recognize Baha'u'llah, call themselves. And it's interesting to observe that there are very little differences between uh, their texts and the texts that we have. This is another manuscript from, uh, I believe this one's held in the Princeton University Library. Uh, you can see, uh, I mean, just to give you an idea of what, what you're dealing with, this is a, a very beautiful uh, uh, manuscript of the Kayyum Lasma, which is in the British Museum or the British Library. And this is a typescript, uh, which, which actually collates two different manuscripts, uh, adding things. There's, you know, in every manuscript, there are scribal slips. Uh, nine times out of ten, these are unintentional. A, a word is written twice or a word drops out here and there. So this is a this is a collation of two manuscripts, very useful. Uh, this is the famous <laughs> published version of the Kayyum al Asma that uh, was discovered in a souk in Damascus by uh, Dr. Daim Magami about five, six, seven years ago, uh, to everyone's surprise. And uh, it's now, as someone mentioned in the, uh, in some of the comments, it is available online. You can download it and uh, read it. It's pretty clear. As far as I've looked into it, it seems to be accurate uh, compared to these older, more venerable manuscripts that we have. This is the publication data. Uh, this is the first the title page. This is the second title page. This is how it looks, very easy to read, and so on. The, the verse endings aren't marked here. Oh, I guess they are with periods. So that's a that's slight innovation, but that's okay. And uh, it's this long. Now, uh, this is a useful text to have access to because of the Arabic is so clear. And it gives me an opportunity now to emphasize a point we made earlier that the Qayyum al-Asma is very, very interesting for a lot of reasons, uh, and probably more than the ones that I that uh, one can mention now. I mean, it's a it's a very interesting text. But in the first place, the thing that is so interesting about it is that it's very difficult to determine with absolute certitude. And this is in the, this was planned, it seems to me, by the Bob, or this is what how the composition turned out to find the difference between the commentary and the text. You see, this is a very beautiful thing. 
uh, and I think a couple of weeks ago we showed the graphic, uh, the miniature of Jacob embracing Joseph and that beautiful, I'll show it again today, but this is, it's as if these two texts are embracing each other and it's difficult to see who is who and what is what. And this is so because even though the Qayyumul Asma is absolutely original and never before done anything like it, the great paradox here is that every word in it and frequently verses of some length are purely Quranic. The orange lines here represents the portion of this chapter that does not exist in the Quran. <laughs> so you get you get a feeling for the what we're dealing with here. You're, you're dealing with, I mean, one of the best ways for me to understand this is to think of um, think of uh, what has for so long been called uh, jazz or improv improvisational music, in which the idea is to play a melody and then to transform the melody into something that is completely different but at the same time, also the same. This is the Badia factor that we were talking about before. It is brand new, but yet ancient. And this is what has happened with this composition of the Bab. In fact, so, so the title of the surah, Mulk, which means dominion or sovereignty or ownership, functions in a number of ways. It's telling, it's telling the reader that the topic is the problem of sovereignty and authority and ownership. But it's also demonstrating that the, that the, that, that the uh, means of making this uh, clear the vehicle for arguing what the true ownership and true sovereignty is, is actually something which the author is exercising pure ownership over. It's a magnificent gesture and in, uh, in composition. And I mean, the, the only word for it really is revelation. So you can see here that even though all of the all of the part in this surah that is not orange, and that's only these few words here, which are names of the uh, imams, everything else has a, a more or less intense connection to the original Quran text. But it's been rearranged, re-musified, if you like, re reoriented. Now, the, the major reorientation is to say to the readership that the Quran should be read in the key of Joseph, the peacemaker, the reconciler, the harmonizer, the beautiful. This is the major point. The ancillary points arise that the, that the true Joseph is returning or will return or has returned, and this is, in fact, the promised one of uh, of Islam, especially Shi'i Islam. So that's uh, that's that printed text uh, can be very useful, and you can download it for free. Now this is my provisional translation of the Surah al Mulk, uh, and it's several pages long, and we won't try to go through the whole thing, but I would like to go through a few uh, verses just it may help to illustrate the nature of this text a little more clearly. Um, and I'm just checking the time because uh, I want to also do something else. Well, maybe what we'll do is return to this. Uh, and I want, to, I want to show you another series of images now. So this, was, this is a, a presentation that I gave uh, 
about four or five years ago to a non-Baha'i audience in Hamburg. Uh, and uh, I, I used this title for it because this was the theme of the conference. They wanted to study rulers who had also been authors. And they actually invited me to come and speak about the Bab. And so uh, I was rather surprised, but nonetheless, I was happy to go. But I had to change the title because it was uh, a little different. The Bab was a ruler of nothing at the time he wrote the Qayyam al -Asma. And so he was, uh, but he was claiming this magnificent uh, power of sovereignty and, uh, and uh, so on. So, but one, once we look into the de the details of the Qayyum al Asma, we we note that uh, the theme, another theme of it, is precisely who ha who has the authority and who doesn't. And so, and in the process of of making this clear. The Bab dwells on several important words of power and authority in the Quran in the space of this 850 approximate words, a very a brief text, really. So, and he names the Shah of Iran by name and, and, and addresses his minister and addresses all the sons of all the kings of the earth to tell them that sovereignty is only theirs to the degree that they recognize the master or owner of true sovereignty. And in the process of making this clear in these 42 verses, the Bab uses a number of, of Arabic words that are from the Quran, but which are also concerned with, with power, authority, and ownership and dominion. The primary one is the Arabic word Allah occurs 59 times. Uh, you mathematicians can quickly judge what percentage of, of those 850 words uh, uh, is Allah. The, you know, according to some, the greatest name of God, but certainly the most characteristic name of God in the Quran. It is the most abstract name of God. It, uh, I think we mentioned uh, that philologists have pondered whether or not its its true meaning becomes clear when you think of it as being an, am an amalgamation of two northern Semitic northern Arabic words for the for the uh, definite article. So it could be translated as the the. This kind of gets the point across because there's no real positive content in the word Allah in the Quran it says many times that you cannot describe him. But then, of course, the Quran sneaks up on you rather unsubtly and says, but God is merciful, God is compassionate, God is patient, and, and, and all of these things. So on the one hand, it says that God is not describable and pure, pure abstraction. And on the other, he's powerful, mighty, all-seeing, all-hearing, and these anthropomorphic words. This is part of the these two poles of uh, perception or consciousness are represents kind of a positive and negative pole in the circuitry of the Quran and generate this distinctive electricity which we as Baha'is inherit in the Baha'i writings we see the same thing in the Baha'i writings on the one hand God is uh, undes indescribable and purely at beyond all possible attempts to to think about, and on the other hand, is closer than your jugular vein. So these are very, very powerful ideas. The next one here is a is a is a root that is very frequent in the Qayyum al Asma. It is uh, the H Q Q, which is, uh, means reality or truth. The most common Arabic word is Haq, uh, a double K on the end, or Kaf. It, has, it is a very exalted name for God, exalted in the same way that Allah is, because Allah is also not susceptible of description. Uh, we know 
uh, al haq we know it's there because it's there uh, but uh, it is a it is a very very highly highly transcendent way of referring to god this happens also to be the same root that is used for the word hukukullah, the rights of god so that it, you know all these arabic words have a range a semantic field a range of meaning and it's most uh, Exalted al haq means the reality, the truth, uh, the, the, a, a trueness that is beyond description or tracking by anyone. It's a favorite word amongst the Sufis who frequently, uh, who many of them use the, the greeting, and, and say, as Baha'i say, Allah wa uh, uh, um, many Sufi orders have uh, will greet each other uh, by saying Ya Haq, or you know, I invoke this highest level of God when I when we meet. The next the next uh, frequent Arabic word for power, dominion, and sovereignty becomes a little more con conceptually. Uh, possible for us mere human beings, whereas Allah and Haq are far beyond our ability to say anything truly concrete or meaningful about. This third word, mulk, is closer to home. It has to do with ownership, something that we all deal with, uh, power, authority, sovereignty, and so on. Uh, the ne and this, this word occurs 20 times. The next word of power is the basic word for the book. Kitab, which means writing in, in the Quran, divine writing, as in Kitab Yakan. Uh, and it has, there are two ways in which it appears in this, in this surah as mother of the book, Umm al Kitab, or as this is the book, which is a very important verse of the Quran in the second surah, uh, which introduces the surah, and it's a it's a trope, if you like. kitab, that is the book, or this is the book about which is about which there is no doubt. So these are two two themes from the Quran that the Bab refers to frequently throughout the entire text, but in this in this chapter twice, and in eighteen other and no, in uh, seven times, and in thirteen other times. He uses the word kitab or the root kitab, kataba, it's a verb as well, meaning to write, to speak about the true nature of ownership, authority, and uh, sovereignty. Then here comes a very powerful uh, root, the QWM, which is the basis for Ka'em and Kiyama, and also Kayum, the title of the work. Qayyum, Qayyum al-Asma. Uh, Qa'em is uh, the one who's expected, of course. Uh, Qiyama is the day, the day of resurrection. And uh, uh, Qayyum is the word that the Bab uses to refer to this work. In the one, one sense, because Qayyum has the same numerical value as the word Joseph in Arabic. And this and the implication there, to some extent, is that Joseph is a more, a, a more complete, if you like, manifestation of, of Qayyum. And the way we translate Qayyum, until somebody comes along with a perfect one, <laughs> and it's a slightly difficult word to translate elegantly, or, uh, clearly, and in one sort of fell poetic, sweep it means it's a name of god in the quran Qayyum, and it's frequently paired with another name of god the living so it's the living the self, it's translated as the self-subsisting in the noonday prayer all right Al -Qayyum, Qayyum. Now what what it means in addition to this or as part of this it means that even though it is an attribute it refers to that reality that is beyond, who is the source of all attributes, Qayyum, 
and by virtue of being the source of all the other attributes, is therefore beyond those attributes. This was an insight that uh, came through in the great Alessandro Balzani's translation, Italian translation of the words Kayum Asma. The, this next root, W-L-Y, is probably, if you had to choose, <laughs> the most important word in the world for Islam and for the Bab, and in some instances, some cases, in some ways, for Baha'i, it's this, this root, W-L-Y, which goes to form the all-important emblem of authority, the word walaya, or wilaya, in Persian, valaya, or vilayat. It means a number of things all at once. It means intimacy. It means friendship. It means reciprocity. It means allegiance. It means loyalty. It means uh, divinity, because in the Quran, God himself is the first bearer of walaya. So it distinguishes itself from those other terms, like Nabi and Rasul, by being, being something that God himself is uh, identified with. God never calls himself a Nabi or a Rasul, but he does call himself a bearer of walaya or a wali, the true friend of the believers. So this is an exceedingly important word. As you know, the guardian station in Arabic is precisely taken from this word wali, the wali amrullah. And, and we trans the word guardian is a translation of this word wali, or which means friend, uh, uh, protector, and guardian, and so on. It's an important word throughout Islam, but it's it's and it's important in Sufism, uh, and it's important in uh, Shiism, and it's important in the Babi and Baha'i religions. It is also the word which is translated as friends in plural. Wali also means friend, so it's a seriously important term, uh, and it, it occurs twice in this uh, this. Uh, text. I don't know if this is helping. It looks like we're moving along. Maybe I should just go very quickly through the remaining words that I have here. Dhik, which means remembrance, is a very common uh, title assumed by the Bab, the remembrance of God, or the, or in the remembrance of the Qa'im. The Bab is also means gate, as everyone knows that this occurs. But all of these words are, in addition to meaning what they mean, also imply sovereignty and true ownership and true dominion. The Sirat is, of course, the famous Sirat al Mustaqim, the true path or the straight path. Hujja is uh, another word to refer to the Ka'em, who's going to be the proof of God. When he returns, everyone will understand uh, God in a direct way. He will prove. Uh, the 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 truth of God and the scriptures of God and so on. And wazir is uh, what's sometimes vizier. It's a, a deputy, sort of minister, another term of power and authority. Um, now here, and I mentioned the coincidence of opposites earlier. This is it occurs twice in the Kayum Asma in this first chapter. Uh, you can see, I didn't make a translation of this, but it, it's, uh, 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 he speaks here about the drop of water in the middle of the fire, right? Uh, or, no, uh, the drop of water on, upon the earth. So earth and water are brought together. And then uh, in the second one, he speaks about the drop of water. Uh, oh, here we are. Around the fire, which is in the drop of water. And it's part of this longer verse. But the main thing I want to focus on now is this, 
this idea of opposites being brought together to say something discursively, but also to challenge our presuppositions about the power of logical discourse and its limitations. Uh, you know, uh, this this figure of the coincidence of opposites is all through the Kalyamala Asma. It, it, it wasn't invented by the Bab. We see it in earlier mystical and spiritual tradition in Islam, but he uses it very deftly. One of the places where it occurs earlier is in the writings of Sohravardi, for example, who was a, a mystic who died in the 1191 and uh, was responsible for uh, uh, a, a very interesting kind of iteration of something that could be seen as progressive revelation uh, if you're a Baha'i. Uh, <laughs> being a Baha'i opens up a lot of windows that aren't there uh, otherwise. But he, uh, he was famous for writing these spiritual or mystical recitals, very beautiful and poetic stories about the myst mystical life. And in one of these, he has a, a, a hero who is a, uh, who he refers to as the young old man. So this is a this is an example of the bringing together of oppositions. This young old man is a source of all wisdom and knowledge, and is a unprecedented uh, uh, event, and so on. Uh, but and we see it elsewhere in the uh, spiritual and mystical writings of Islam. Here we have just to give you a, a brief look at what the table of contents of the. Kalyamalasma. Uh, this is, this is. Uh, uh, I, I'm sorry that it's in the Arabic version. It's, uh, but this, these are the names, the titles of all 111 chapters, and over here are the specific disconnected letters that the Bab uses to begin each one of his chapters to continue the the idea of the Quran, that this is a that this is the true Quran, uh, that he is that he is bringing about. And then here is another, uh, just show you one more time, this, this beautiful miniature of the, of the reconciliation of Jacob and Joseph and the return of the family. Okay, so, um, we, I guess we can go back now to the, to the translation, but, I don't know, that could be a little dull, and I, I'm getting tired of hearing myself talk. I wonder, I wonder if it's a good idea to have some questions at this time, or some comments. Uh, while you're thinking of things, I'll just, I wrote down five things that I wanted to get, a, get across in this session today. And one, one is that, you know, art and religion, and for that matter, science, have have in common that they they either discern or wish to make order out of apparent chaos, and so and we leave science, which is uh, not my bailiwick at all, and talk about art and religion. We can see that in in the uh, writings of the Bab even though they themselves have been seen as chaotic by people who weren't qualified to read them, also wish to make order out of the chaos of the time and place in which the Bab lived. It was a very difficult historic time. There were all sorts of competitions and strifes and, and dislocations and injustices going on. And, uh, you know, the people who became the letters of the living saw in the Bob's writings and claims uh, hope for a, a future that had not really been contemplated before. The, the big future that had been contemplated by Shiism was, <laughs> and this is, this is nothing really to write home about, was the end of the world. So, you know, how encouraging can this be? But the Bob's rewriting and re-revelation of the Quran demonstrated that there was there was life, there was a future. And this came about, I think, 
because what Bob demonstrates in this work, and especially the first on the first evening with Mullah Hussein, is that if Well, let's phrase it slightly differently. What it demonstrated is that there is that there is great hope in the Bob's work, which is primarily fed by the vitality of his imagination. The chapters of the Quran that he reads and re-reveals, the verses of the Quran that he reads and re-reveals and brings together in new different unprecedented ways demonstrate that with the imagination there is life that there that there, you know there is no such thing as the end of the world the end of the world turns out to be by comparison sort of a a cowardly wishful thinking no we can't do anything else but the bob demonstrates to everyone that the in the imagination there is life in the same way, you know, this is the way that we spoke about music earlier and the way that these, especially uh, improvisational musicians, uh, some of which actually wrote their music down, people like Bach and, and, and Mozart and so forth, so forth uh, you know, thought the music out, which was very improvisational and then wrote it down so it became classical. But people who, Later on, like uh, like Dizzy Gillespie or John Coltrane, who took familiar songs and reworked them, demonstrated once again the power of the imagination to broaden the horizons for humanity, whether musically or spiritually or morally. So th this was the, the great gesture that the Bob uh, showed his, his, uh, his society. People over the last few weeks have talked about wanting to read the Qayyum al Asman, and I think it's a very good idea to do so. And they've asked, what is the best way to pre prepare? And th the best way to prepare is to read the Quran. It's to read, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you know, we don't, please do not get hung up about what is the best or the most <laughs> authentic uh, Quran. It, it doesn't matter at this stage, honestly. Believe me. I mean, the Guardian preferred the Rodwell. Uh, one of the reasons he liked the Rodwell, I believe, is because Rodwell organizes the Soros chronologically. So this appealed to the Guardian's sense of order and, and so on. But the Guardian passed away before some of these new, uh, new Qurans came out that are just absolutely beautiful uh, translations. All of them are abject failures when compared with the original. So the best, the best preparation for reading the Qayyum al-Asma is to read the Quran. And the, you know, there, there are countless translations to choose from. Uh, I've mentioned one or two. You can't go wrong by picking up a Quran and reading it. I mean, unless it's just simply an egregious sort of crime against humanity type translation, you know. But uh, maybe we will mention four or five names of, of Qurans and put them on the website for people later to, to consult. But that, again, that is the best possible way to prepare for reading the Qayyum al-Asma. Then you have a sense of what some of these puzzling things that the Bob says, where they began, where they started. This was another obstacle with the people who read, read the, especially the Westerners who read the Bob's writings. They hadn't been deeply enough schooled in the text of the Quran. So they, they were lost on a number of scores. Um, we talked about this Badi element being uh, iterated uh, frequently and repeatedly in the Ayum al -Asma. Um, I think that's everything. That's everything I wanted to say. The main thing is that the Bob freed the imagination to to think about uh, the human self, human society, and time and future in a new and a very uh, uh, 
very important and exhilarating uh, uh, way, giving hope uh, where it did not exist before. Okay, so I think uh, I'll stop there and see what's what we what we have to say to each other. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Todd. Um, this is really quite fascinating, and and I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit about how <clears throat> the Quranic verses are used in, for example, the Surah of Dominion. Is it that, for example, there might be, um, you know, Quran 5.16 here, and then the next sentence, uh, Bob writes, has a piece of Quran 8. 17 and a piece of Quran 35, 16 in it. Is it that kind of a yes a together? Yeah, that's an important question. Uh, I asked to be put up a translation of two surahs, one by Mujan and one by myself. Especially in the one that I have done there, you will see every Quranic verse tracked and footnoted in that it's a, a later surah in, in the Paya Malasma, but, but rather than trying to talk about it, you'll see it because it's overwhelming. I mean, there's just so many. But beyond the actual instances and tracking them down and identifying them, what we should appreciate and know as readers of this text is that for Muslims and for especially mystically, philosophically, and spiritually inclined Muslims like the Sheikhia, the Sheikh, Sheikh Ahmad and so on, and the Shi'i theosophists and so on, the, 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 every verse of the Quran is a branch of the burning bush. Hmm. You see? Every word and every syllable is a twig that is burning with the energy of God. So what's happening when the Bob is manipulating these and bringing them together, he's rearranging the flames. And this is what is felt. It's not so much the, the discursive meaning, although this is also very important. But the idea is that he presumed to yeah. rearrange the flames. And in the process, he, obviously, he got burnt. And he also became a flame. Yeah. And that's what the, why why the star is so important because it uh, it shows this flaming man this flaming star that is cool and hot and near and distant and all of these things uh, so yes if, if people go to that it's on the I saw it it's uh, Nikki or Candace put it up uh, it's called Moman and Lawson I think it's two chapters from that book, Most Noble Pattern, which came out about five or six years ago, which has a number of articles about the Bob's writings, which people might also like to know about. I, I hesitate to ask this. How many hours have you studied the Koran? I mean, you must read it practically every day. Well, you can do nothing better, really, than to read the Koran. <laughs> And, and it's from the very beginning of my my introduction to Islamic studies, I was captivated by the idea of the Quran and the role that it played in the pious life of Islam, both culturally and individually, and and the way it generated sciences and all of these things. I was very fortunate. I don't know if I mentioned, but my first teacher was a Palestinian Muslim who was a, oh, I did, I mentioned, he was a student of Zayn Zayn. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hannah Cassis, who's now getting old and is frail and uh, poor fellow. I, I, hope, I hope he's not suffering too much. But uh, to be in his presence, to hear him speak, because he knew Arabic upside down, and he was also a literature man who loved poetry, and to be there and listen to him speak about the way the, and generates meaning, the way it affects the heart. And I mean, this is a this is an academic speaking, you know. So I was right away. I said, "We're this is a different order of being that we're dealing with." You see, and so I became attached. I mean, I haven't I I I've read it and I read it and I love it and uh, all the rest of it. The other thing too, once you start studying a little bit of Arabic, 
you can get an interlinear or side by side version of the Quran, and you will be you will surprise yourself at how how it helps you make sense out of the Arabic language by reading it and following it. It's a great thing for people to do. You know, I mean, I realize it's not everybody's cup of tea, and we do not have. And the, the Baha'i faith is rather interesting in that it says it's the the scriptures do not have to be in the original language to be binding liturgically or legally or morally or whatever it happens to be and so that's that's interesting that means but but in the case of the quran which is so much about the aesthetic experience of of spirituality it is uh it is something that people if they have the slightest inclination should should give themselves the permission to pursue <laughs> How much do you read it in Arabic versus English? I presume mostly in Arabic. Well, probably 50-50, you know, yeah. Well, what I find interesting to do also, and there's a great web page somewhere that helps you do this, is to compare different translations of the same verse. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I find this endlessly fascinating. It helps you, it helps you also understand Arabic. Uh, better, which is a lifetime uh, sort of Effort. thing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, you know, I don't want to, I, I really don't want to scare people because you, Arabic is a language that human beings use. Mm -hmm. it, it is not, it, it is, it's not like trying to learn Martian or something, you know, it is a language, but because it has a different uh, semantic structure, it takes a little while to get into it. Mm -hmm. But but it's a lot easier to to learn than than you might think. I've heard other people say that to me also, actually. Yeah. And uh, what was the other question I was going to ask you? To, to what extent has Shoghi Effendi actually offered translations of Quranic verses as opposed to quoting Rodwell and Sale and such? I that'd be a good topic for a paper or something. I haven't really uh, gone into that very much. Uh, he has certainly chosen certain translations, you know, and I think I think it would be wise to look at all of the major translations that were available to him when he was writing, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, compare them and see what. I do know that in a number of instances when I have gone, he has sw he has adjusted things here and there in very interesting ways. Mm -hmm. uh, just but sometimes he hasn't as well. Sometimes wow. he's just left it that way. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Uh, Farzine asks, can the printed tablet that you showed us be downloaded? And I actually be nice if the, some of those PowerPoints or some of those slides could be made available to people. Sure. The printed tablet, you mean the star or the actual Koyomal Asma? Perhaps he will respond and clarify because uh, he doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. Okay. So, asks, did I hear you say that the most incomparable experience of reading the Quran would be to read the original? What would that be? The original Quran wasn't written down, was it? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't want to get involved in semantics, okay? Well, you're refer yeah, but you're referring to the literary text anyway. You're to refer to referring to the standard written Quranic text. You can, you can go to like dozens of websites online and sit there with the lights out and listen to the Quran being chanted by by people obviously it's there's been 1400 years between now and then things have changed right uh, unless you can tell me a good way to transport oneself back to 7th century Arabia in uh, Mecca or Medina and be at the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad upon be whom be God's blessing and peace, and sit there and listen, you know, we obviously cannot hear it in its original form, all right? Uh, Heraclitus says you, you can't step into the same river twice. I think you can't step into the same river once. <laughs> okay, so, you know, things are always changing, but you have to, as human beings, the human part of the human vocation is try to adjust to these things. Yeah. 
would, would you like to share a few, go back into the translations you wanted to share a few verses with us. This is a good time to do that. We don't have any other questions right now, but we may get some more if you uh, want to share some of those verses with us. Oh, my, my translation? Yeah. Okay. All right, so this is uh, basically, I use that uh, TypeScript to, tra to, to translate this, and that's not a very important detail. But you see here that we have two titles, Kitab Meum al Asma, or Tafsir Asan al Qasas. Also, it's known as the Tafsir Surat Yusuf. And it's about Joseph. So, this is the way it begins. Uh, it has a little sort of doxological statement at the very top, which is not, I think, not part of the text. Verily in him do we seek help. That's a common formulaic little prayer that begins, uh, the Sheikhis seem to like this one, but they're not the only ones. Uh, and then we have the title. This is the Surat al mulk revealed in Shiraz, it says, and there are 42 verses. Ayat. And as you know, the word ayat means simultaneously verse and divine sign. All right? It's the word that they use for the, for the title of Ayatollah, right? for better or for worse. Okay, so, so this is, uh, there are 42 verses. The first verse is actually complete reiteration of a verse of the Quran, the Basmala, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. But, the, but by saying it again, the Bab sort of re-reveals it, you see. It's exactly the same words. And it's, a, you know, it's, it's in, in itself a small prayer in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. The, and, and as you know, the merciful, the compassionate are, are the two words by which God is known the most in the Quran. And it's Rahman, Rahim. And they both, they come from the same Arabic root, Rahim, which means womb in Arabic. So these have a very definite maternal a, f a feminine uh, aspect to these these uh, these attributes of God. So these are they, they could also be translated as the loving, the uh, the unconditional loving, the uh, and so on. So this is but this is the common translation for that in the name of God, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Praise be to God, he who hath caused his book to come down to his servant by the truth, bil haq, that it, and here it's ambiguous, there's a certain amount of ambiguity, uh, intentional ambiguity, a, you might call it uh, uh, multivocality or something like that in the Bob's writings, because these pronouns are frequently very fuzzy. Do they... Who do they absolutely refer to? Do they refer to the book that he's talking about up here, or do they refer to his servant here? And also, it's important to know that the, the name his servant is a Quranic trope or figure used to refer to the prophet, Muhammad. So you wouldn't know this unless you read the Quran, you see. So you, you have praise be to God, he who has caused this book to come down to his servant. So he's saying his servant is the prophet Muhammad, and oh, what do you know? It's also me, right? Now this is re really important stuff. Um, by the truth, bil haq, that word H Q Q again, uh, that it, and then again the ambiguity, he, the book or the servant, might be a luminous lamp, that is siraj, uh, unto all the worlds. At the end of the the most of these verses I've given the Arabic word by which it ends, so you get an idea of the rhyme. The Ayyumul Asma rhymes from beginning to end, just like the Quran. So it's it's a poetic, musical experience uh, about which there can be no doubt. Okay, a luminous lamp uh, is a Quranic phrase. Uh, uh, I mean, if if I wanted to. I do want to, but uh, what I should have done for this course, perhaps, is to make the, the precise Quranic words, the, one, the words that aren't just derivations of Quranic words, a different color, so you see, and put the number of their 
uh, verse and and uh, surah and verse beside them. But that clutters things up so much. That's why if you want to get an idea of this, you can download that PDF that says Moman and Lawson. And uh, Mujan has done a beautiful job on one of those surahs. And I, I had translated them, but I paid more attention to the Quranic content in mind. So you can get an idea of how the thing is radiated with Quranic words. So verily, and, oh, another thing, this second, surah, second verse here, many, many, many Quranic surahs begin with a reference to its being revealed or it's coming down. This is a this is a known feature of many many of the verses. So again, the Bab is is performing the Quran by doing the same thing here. And then the third verse, verily, this is the exalted path. You all know the idea of the path is a Quranic notion. In the very first surah, the surah surah of the opener or the opening, this is the exalted path according to your Lord, in truth it is mentioned in the mother book, upon the truth, as straight and righteous, mustaqiman. Now, I think we probably won't have a whole lot of time to do much more, right, Rob? Um, I suppose we don't have any other questions yet, so go ahead and do a Okay, I'll carry on, but what I want to do is focus a little bit on this truth, okay. in the truth that is mentioned, upon the truth. This... <clears throat> The way in which the Bab uses this word truth, which is hak again, or hakika, uh, is part of the musicality of the Qayyum al -Asma. He uses it in many, many verses to separate clauses from each other and to work out the uh, sort of the free verse meter of the, of the verse and to build up to a, a proper kind of climax in each verse. Uh, but the word hak means the highest thing that you can think of God being. It is, as I mentioned, the most abstract after Allah word for God that we have. And it's and it means reality and truth. It's a very powerful word. But he uses it in different derivations and in different uh uh parts of the verse to to get it, it lends a certain rhythm to the text but also it gives us real continuity to the experience of the text so that it's it, it's it, the word truth is a very pallid way of trying to translate it, uh, the existence of this word ah, and in uh, the Bob's chapter here. And in the mother book, it is before us, <clears throat> in, indeed sublime. You see here, there's a, another, you, in English, we call them puns, but because that sounds a little frivolous, I mm -hmm. hesitate hesitant to use the word pun. But here, this Ali is also the Bob's name, as you well know. So in, on the one hand, he's saying that the mother book uh, the, this text is sublime according to the mother book, but it also means it belongs to Ali, the Ba, Ali Muhammad. And according to the greatest truth, again, in the estimation of the most merciful, it is wise. So Ali and Hakim, wise and sublime or exalted, are two frequent pairs of attributes in the Quran that exist innumerable times. And he's just showing again, a different sort of take on it uh, in a magnificent way. <laughs> uh, he, capital he, or lowercase it, it's again, impossible to say with absolute certainty, is the truth direct from God upon the pure religion of Dean al Khalis, as has been inscribed in the mother book, Masturan, you know, um, Let's go down a little further. He is most certainly the truth, or it is most certainly truth, and path to God through the heavens and the earth. So whoever wants, take him in very truth as a path leading to God. That is to say, follow the Bab as a path leading to God. Sabilan. 
He is the straight religion, or it is the straight religion, and God suffices him as a witness regarding his knowledge of the book, uh, which is incredible. To be able to write like this and to play the Quran as if it were a musical instrument, uh, unbelievable. Verily, he is the truth with the truth, according to the greatest word from God, the ancient. Indeed, he has been raised up from the precincts of the divine fire. Indeed, he is the secret in the heavens and the earth and is engaged upon a wondrously new cause, the Al-Amr al badi through the permission of God, the sublime. Again, a reference to himself, Ali, is also the, which is also the name of the first imam, right? But it happens also to be the name of the Bab. And he, it, has been ordained or written down in the mother book in truth. God has ordained that this book, Dhalik al-Kitab, is a very powerful reference from the second story, the second verse, I think, of the first, an explanation of the most beautiful story, Tafsir Asan al-Asan, be brought out from its hiding with, with the hidden imam. And here he mentions all the names of the imams. Because, as you know, the Qayyam al-Asma says that it is really the true Qur'an that has been in hiding with the hidden imam since the year 874, right? I mean, the, clearly, the Bab knows that it is a different work. <laughs> this, you know, the Bab knows that it is a different work. But this is a poetic or imaginative gesture that he's saying that this is the same book. This is what perhaps what people would refer to as a pious fiction, saying that it comes from the hidden imam uh, as a book, because the, the Bob was writing it down as he was talking about it. He, he didn't. It wasn't like Joseph Smith finding the, <laughs> the you know the golden plates. I mean, the, the, the writing came forth. The book came forth from the line of the hidden imams. Uh, okay, to his servant, that is to say, the Bob, that it might be a convincing proof. Allah, which is also a name for the hidden imam, from the remembrance, which is also a name for the hidden imam, but it's a name that the Bab participated in, in the writing of this work, uh, unto all the worlds. I call God to witness, as he bears witness to his own self, that he is the truth. No God is there but him. And the angels and those with knowledge stand firm around the remembrance with justice. There is no God but him. While he is God, knower of all things. The pure religion is the, this flawless remembrance. Again, it's fuzzy. Are we speaking about the hidden imam who we're supposed to think hasn't appeared yet? Or are we thinking about the Bob who is there and making the hidden imam present through this act of imagination? Therefore, he who wishes for himself Islam, let him submit to his cause and God inscribe him in the book of the righteous as a true Muslim upon the pure religion, which has been in the estimation of God praised. And he who dis disbelieves in Islam, God will never accept from him, from his meritorious acts in truth and by the truth, anything at all. And it is imperative that God burn him with the wondrously new fire by virtue of the law of the book, according to the law of the Bab, in truth and with the truth, which is preordained. God is he of whom there is no God but him, and he is God completely aware of all Muslims. God is he of whom there is no God but him, and he is God witness over all Muslims. God is he of whom there is no God but him, and he is God knower of all Muslims. God is he of whom there is no God but him, and he is God comprehender of all or surrounder of all Muslims. Verily, God will never accept from anyone any act except that it be brought to the Bab, prostrating through the Bab in praise to God, the ancient around the Bab. God has permitted you in truth to prostrate and draw near. Indeed, fire prostrates in the point of water to God, the truth upon the earth with the truth witnessed. O company of kings and sons of kings, all of you have most certainly turned away from the beautiful sovereignty of God. This is another word for beauty uh, from the root uh, Jamil. 
O King of the Muslims, aid to victory after the book, our most great remembrance with the truth that God may ordain for you and those surrounding you on the day of resurrection, the day of Piyama, to be stopped and questioned upon the path. Okay. Beware, O King, by God, the truth, if you are an enemy of the remembrance, God will judge against you on the day of Piyama from among all the kings with hellfire, and you will find that day none apart from God, the sublime, Ali again, the truth, in truth, a helper. How are we doing, Rob? It's um, eight, what's 15 after now? Uh, 16 well, after. We have a couple more questions now. You want to have a couple more questions? Sure, yeah. There are about, uh, as you see, there are 18 more verses to go, but I think this gives people an idea of a kind of a vague idea. Uh, the translation uh, could be improved a lot uh, of how how the composition unfolds. So, okay, let's look at some questions. Okay. Yeah, there was a couple more here. Let me adjust my screen a little bit. Um, okay. Uh, War Allen asks a question about where can I find more instruction in working with the idea of a coincidence of opposites? Do you know where we can find it? Well, there's a, you, Carl Jung's last great book was on this topic. So it's uh, the coincidence of opposites, uh, Carl Jung. Mm -hmm. This is this is the sort of textbook, but uh, that's one place. There's a chapter in my book on the, called Gnostic Apocalypse. There's a chapter in there on the coincidence of opposites. I think there's also, a pre-publication version on H Baha'i you can download if you want to. Uh, coincidence of opposites. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a very important uh, thing, uh, idea, trope, mm -hmm. image, because it uh, well it's very productive and generative. So it was okay. Next, uh, Sue Emil asks. Um, in a footnote to one of the passages in the Bayou Malasma, I noticed that the name Koratal Ain, Solace of the Eyes, refers to the Bab himself. What is the significance of that this name was also given to Tahere? Uh, well, that, that name, yes, is used by the Bab, and it, it, it means, it, it's, it's in, uh, let me, it means someone who, it, it's a relief to see them, you know, the world is a mess, all the rest, but when I see you, I feel better kind of thing. That's what it means. It also has connotations of beauty and, uh, you know, visual beauty as well. Uh, the prophet said three things are the solace to my eye. And, uh, you know, one of them was uh, prayer and one of them was the color green and mm -hmm. one of them was perfume, I think. Something like that. So uh, it's a it's a familiar Arabic uh, word. Kurut al Ain was also a, a title given to Fatima, mm -hmm. the prophet's daughter, as was Tahere, by the way. And in some senses, our Kurut al Ain is a re a, a reperformance of the original Fatima. Mm -hmm. Do you know that in the Bayan, in the first opening pages, the Bob says that all the letters of the living are the return of those, the, the 12 Imams, Fatima, the four Bobs of the lesser, of the greater occultation, and the prophet. And, uh, you know, I think he was quite serious. William Faulkner said, the past isn't dead, it's not even past. Right? The, these people feel all of this around them at all times. You know, this history is, time is meaningless in a sense. So, uh, It's present, it's continuously omnipresent. There you are. Yes. Um, Sina asks, uh, it would be very interesting to hear the poetic sonority of the verses in Arabic as well. And this raises a very interesting topic. As you know, as you may know, the Bab himself was not an Arab. He was a Shirazi Persian. 
And it's quite likely that his pronunciation was not the kind of pronunciation that all Arabs would immediately love. Of course. Yeah. So the question is, do you want to have a trans... You, you want to have it recited by someone whose Arabic is perfect, Fusha, or do you want to have it recited by a Persian who knows the text very well? If you want to hear it recited by a Persian who knows the text very well, you can go to my website and listen to Dr. Muhammad Afna, who mm -hmm. passed away recently, who very kindly agreed to record, as you know, he's a descendant from the Bob's family, record this very first chapter wow. uh, in Persian. I. <laughs> You can go there, and I have I downloaded the the sound file. I can upload it to you. People can download it if they want to. Yeah, can we you can. Have sound files on your on we your. Can, yeah, we can stick a sound file up in, both not only on the course pages, but also for the web talk page that's open to the public. If you want to do that, or yeah, that'd be okay. I mean, it's you know, it's. Uh, well, these are they're different aesthetic experiences. They're both. That's right. I've heard Persians recite prayers in Arabic, and then I've heard Arabs recite prayers in Arabic, and there's a very noticeable difference of intonation and of of sound quality. But it's they're both beautiful. Well, there's a different shape to the vowels and a different value to the consonants, and yeah. uh, you know, uh, so these are these are considerations. Yeah, but I will definitely send that sound file in so people can listen to Dr. Muhammad Afnan recite the first chapter of the Qayyum al-Asma. That'd be very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ramtin says, "I read the Surah al-Mulk and didn't see any interpretation in reference to the Surah of Joseph. However, there is a Surah of Joseph in the Qayyum al-Asma with more information about the Surah of Joseph. But I'm still confused about the significance of the Surah of Joseph." and the Bob's mission to interpret the Surah al-Mulk and didn't see any interpretation in reference to the Surah of Joseph. Well, However, there, is, um, there is the reference to the best of stories. No, it's, it's, it perme it's everywhere. Uh, Ramtin, is it? Yes. Ramtin, it's a, I, I'm sorry that it hasn't become more clear in the course of these attempts, uh, but it's absolutely everywhere. The, the whole thing is called the Qayyum al-Asma, which is a code word for Joseph. Uh, the, the whole thing, I think we talked about this earlier, maybe you weren't there. Uh, there were, uh, you know, it's modeled on the 111 verses of the Surah of Joseph. It talks about, I mean, maybe he wasn't at the first one, because I thought we covered this fairly. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I think if you want to communicate with me privately, that would be okay, mm -hmm. Ramtin. Next. Well, Scott Hakala made exactly the point you just made, and that's he's, he, he was listening to the recording of, of Dr. Muhammad Afnan uh, on your site. So he was mentioning it and suggesting that we, uh, well, we mention it to people, so other people have noticed that as well. Right. Uh, a comment from Facebook from uh, Farid, do you think the style and the meaning of the Bob's writings were intended to be comprehended by future generations, giving the, given the obscure style? Thank you so much, Dr. Lawson, for a wonderful talk. I think that they were, absolutely. But the, these people wrote in, if you like, obscure style because the basic axiom of education was that you learn by dealing with things that are difficult and you proceed in a deeper understanding the more times you read it and the more you think about it and the more you practice your religion the more you suffer and the more you forgive all of these things in some mysterious way add up to there's a very important hadith that Baha'u'llah quotes many times and which the Bab quotes many times and all, especially Shi'i Muslims, love. It is ascribed to Ali sometimes, sometimes to the Prophet. It says, and you, you'll know, you'll know this when I read it to you, when I 
related to you. Our cause is exceedingly abstruse, mm -hmm. right? And the Arabic is Saab Mustasab. Saab Mustasab. Our, ab, incredibly difficult. Saab means difficult. Our cause, or sometimes it says our knowledge or our writing. There are variations. The only people who understand it are sent prophets, near angels who have been brought near, Muqarabun, and a believer whose heart has been tested. And this word for testing in Tahana is, is a word that they also use for making leather softer. Mm -hmm. So it means that the heart has been kneaded so that it can accept the truth. So understanding is not just an intellectual thing. Understanding has to do with how you live your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry to be so long-winded, but these questions are very interesting, and uh, we got more. I'm, I'm long-winded. <laughs> we got more. We got more questions here. We got more questions here. Okay. Um, Farid also mentions uh, this Melville's Moby Dick. Beautiful. In 1851, in a style introduced a new genre of neologistic idiosyncratic writing, as if the Bob set in motion a new era of writing and thinking the world over. That's magnificent. I love Moby Dick. I think this is a very, very astute observation. Uh, and the Bob, Moby Dick, and then Ulysses, you could chart a line across. I don't see that question on my sh my page. So uh, who said uh, this? Uh, this was uh, Farid Sabet, whose comment came from Facebook. And this has been put in the chat. Uh, folder, not in the Q and A. Uh, I see. Oh, well, thank you, Farid. That's an excellent observation. Thank you. I uh, agree. Oh, there it is. I see it now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's chat and there's Q and A, and I've been going back and forth between the two. And right now, I'm looking at chat. And you know, also that Melville's book, and uh, Farid knows, of course, but in Melville's book was the first book in American literature that talked about the unity of mankind because on on his ship everybody in the universe is there working with against uh, all sorts of odds dealing with captain ahab and chasing this white whale which nobody knew what it really was and, but they you know people from all over all kinds of races were mixed uh, and melville definitely had his uh, had his fingers on the pulse of something super important yeah I mean, you could say that reading Moby Dick would also help you read the claim of last month. But don't quote me. <laughs> <laughs> There's no whale in the claim of last month, at any rate. Well, that's not so true. <laughs> okay. uh, Ra Ramtin uh, also asks this question. I read the story of Joseph in the Koran, which is the same as in the Old Testament. Could you elaborate more about the significance of the Surah of Joseph and why it is considered the best of stories? I think you may have elaborated on this in one or the other. I think I did, Ramtin. Yeah, you weren't at the first presentation. So, Ramtin, why don't you write to me and I can send you things that you may need, okay? As a, uh, that's a good, important question, but I'd like to uh, move on if that's all right. Sure. Um, and Boyd has also forwarded another one. Uh, but from Farid Sabet, is this translated as the long protection prayer of the Bob in the prayer book? Uh, sure. Is what translate? Sorry, I'm not sure. It's I'm not sure what he's referring to here. Um, the long protection prayer of the Bob in the prayer book. I'm not even sure which prayer that is. So. Nor am I. Yeah. Let me see what else we have under Q&A, because I think we have a few more under Q&A. Yes. Uh, Irina says, just joining an hour late. Uh, so it might have been already covered, but if not, I would like to know what is the Bob's interpretation of Zulecha and her acts towards Joseph and Joseph's ability to, re to interpret dreams? <laughs> 
in the Bob's earlier commentary, which is on the Surat al-Baqarah, he engages in the act of Quran commentary in a traditional way, which he says, this means that, or this means this, this, and this, or this has seven elements, and that means like, this happens very rarely in the Qayyum al-Asma. The interpretation that the Bab gives is of a different order. And there's no, well, I, I should read it again, maybe. But I don't, I don't recall a particularly striking part in which he tries to clear up the problem with Zuleika as such. Uh, as you know, Zuleika is not mentioned as Zuleika in the Quran. It's the, the wife. And so certainly the wife uh, would be mentioned. But uh, who, who asked this question? Uh, Irina, Irina Koenig. Oh, Irina. Yeah, I've seen messages from her. Irina, if you drop me a line, I will actually look it up for you because now you've got me interested. And Zulekha is Potiphar's wife, I think people... That's right, but yeah. she's not... That word doesn't... Zulekha doesn't occur in the Quran. Or even in the Old Testament, I wonder. I don't know. I think but just Potiphar occurs in the Old Testament. Pot really. Potiphar does, I think, but... Yeah. Okay. He also... Irina also says, if the Bob interprets one verse into a chapter... How does the content of the Surah al Mulk relate to the first verse of the, sur the Surah of Joseph? You had mentioned the numbers were the same. Number of I should send this person a check for asking this question. <laughs> because the first Surah is different than the other ones in that it does not choose a verse from the Qayyum al Asma to comment on directly. It's more of an introduction. Uh -huh. The first verse of the Qayyum al Asma is. And mentioned in the second surah, the surah of the ulama. So, very first, good. <laughs> first verse of the surah of Joseph, you mean. That's right. Is mentioned in the second chapter of the... Correct, of the yes, correct, yeah. Interesting. So is every single chapter subsequently of Agayim al-Asma referring back to a subsequent verse? Yes, that's right. That's how it's structured. Uh -huh. It's structured under... E each chapter is, except for the first one, structured under a verse of the Qayyum al -Asma. You could say, stretching it a little bit, that since the Basmala is a verse of the Qur'an, that because it is there, the Bab may be seeing this as the first verse of the Qayyum al of the of the story of Joseph. Mm -hmm. But it's very, it's very general in a sense. So, yeah. So, uh, Emil notes, Melville was born the same year as the Bob. Ah. It's sort of interesting. Excellent. That is interesting. Uh, and let me see a few more questions. Another one from Ramteen. There is a reference in the Qayyum al-Asma to Sheikh Ahmad and Sayyid Qazem that God says he sent them to people and people didn't pay attention. Were they also divine entities? What was their mission? Well, as we know from Nabil, that their their mission was as forerunners to the Bob's message. So you could, I suppose, say they were a little bit divine somehow. Or something, you know. Like John the Baptist. Yeah, except there's a controversy surrounding that one. You know. Yeah. It was John the Baptist. The Bob is frequently compared to John the Baptist, but it's very explicit in the Baha'i instance that the Bob is no less holy than than uh, Baha'u'llah, whereas some interpretations of Christian revelation history see John the Baptist as being of a lower rank. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Those are all the questions. Okay. And we've gone an hour and a half, actually a little longer, so I think we've, uh, we've covered it well. We've earned our pay, have we? Earned our pay. We've earned our pay. All right. So thank you again very, very much. Oh, one more question. Well, it says one more, but there's no other question there. Maybe she's going to type it in a minute. Thank you so much. Oh, there, uh, there is one more. In the QA, 
Uh, what else are we getting here? It's from er uh, Arena again. Arena, yes. Go ahead, Arena. Maybe she thought we'd quit. Yeah, perhaps. Oh, there it goes. Um, from Boyd, uh, another question here. What is the interpretation of the disconnected letters at the beginning of the Surah of Joseph? That's a good question. Sure is. Uh, well, I, I'd, have to, I'd have to look at the manuscript to be able to tell you precisely what that is. If you want to write me a note and remind me to do that, I'll happily check it out for you. Well, it's clearly an imitation of the style of the Koran, though maybe imitation is not a very nice way of putting it. Um, but... I think it's a, an appropriation, a reperformance, uh, and then also an imitation. I mean, yeah. the, as you know, in Islamic culture, imitation is a very big part of piety. The imitation of the prophet, the son of the prophet, the imitation of you know, the pious forefathers and so on. Imitation is not a bad thing. Originality is, has a very different role and is construed differently in especially pre-modern cultures, but especially in the case of Islam. So, yeah, it is there a fully authorized? Here's something else. Yeah, of the biomolasma approved by the House of Justice. Of no. That there's not even a, any translation other than in selections from the writings of the Bob. That's there. right, yeah. Um, well, Which everybody we're... else has been saying thank you, thank you, thank you. So let's uh, use that as a good way of wrapping up our program today. And Todd, thank you again for three fascinating sessions, which I think people will be watching for many years. Oh, well, that's very kind of you to say. Thank you, Rob, for asking me. Hello, every, hello and goodbye, everyone. It's, I hope to not see you again one of these days. That's right. And, uh, well, enjoy. Well. Enjoy well, the Quran. <laughs> yeah, well, certainly, and we want, probably ought to remind people that you did an entire series of three programs on the Quran for us a year or so ago. All right. Thank and you. those are up on our, our YouTube channel. So if people want to uh, go back and look at those, uh, they should. And uh, You know, you all know that in the Priceless Pearl, uh, it, it's written that when the Guardian was a baby, Abdul Baha would retain uh, the expert Quran reciter and have him come by the house once a week to recite to the infant Shoghi Effendi the Quran wow. while, while he was in his crib. Yes. Huh. Yes, that's right. <laughs> gave him the musicality. Well, right and, away. And everything. <laughs> and everything. Yeah. So, without further ado, thank you again. And Thanks. Look we look forward to another series from you in another <laughs> year or so. I look forward to it myself. Once you're ready, let us know, and we will schedule you for some more. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very again, much. And uh, looking forward to that. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye, everyone.